In this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about an example of relief sculpture known as the Warka vase. And this is actually a fairly famous monument that was in the um, Baghdad Museum. And then when the museum was, it was actually looted after the Americans uh, landed and, and I guess invaded in Iraq. And it was looted and uh, the Warka vase disappeared for a while. It was returned in, I think, 2005. And then the Iraq Museum actually is, uh, the Baghdad Museum of Antiquities is closed right now and boarded up and nobody's exactly sure, I guess, what's going on with the work of base, which is really too bad. I mention this because one of the possible topics that you can research for your cultural heritage paper project is going to be the Iraq Museum and the sort of, you know, what, what happens in wartime when you have a uh, uh, an important cultural heritage like the Iraq Museum. So it's it's kind of an interesting topic that's germane to current events. Anyway, let's take a look at the Warka vase. The Warka vase is a very, very old, uh, circa 3200 BC, large alabaster um, vase that, an alabaster is just a kind of white stone, um, semi-precious stone, that's fairly easy to carve along the sort of consistency of limestone. So it's not super hard um, like diorite or marble. It's or it's a, a little bit easier to carve. And what you see on the outside of this vase is one of the first surviving examples we have of a clear narrative story being told. This is actually older than the lyre that uh, you looked at in the second lecture that was the lyre of Queen Puabi. Um, this is also Sumerian. It's a bit older and it's a real early example of storytelling, of real narrative storytelling clearly being depicted on the outside uh, or on, a, on an object. And it's what's called relief sculpture. We've seen relief sculpture before. If you think back to the woman of Losel, that is where there is uh, 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 stone and the, uh, or it's where an object is carved and there's some three dimensionality, there's some raised area and some, you know, sunken area. Um, it's textured, right? But it's low relief. That is, it's very shallow, it's very flat, it's not carved all the way out through the background. Things don't project off of the surface very much. So it's what's called low relief sculpture. And that's a vocabulary term you should know and be able to identify something like this as an example of low relief sculpture. You can also see here another vocabulary term that we've mentioned in the past, and that is registers. There are four distinct registers or bands on which stories are being told or which images are arranged, almost like a comic strip. You can see there at the bottom are plants, and then there are animals in the second register. There in the middle register are people bearing baskets of gifts and then on the top register they are bringing those gifts to the lady of heaven in Nana who um, we have you'll run into her name a couple of times in your textbook I think so there is everything on this face all the registers are related to one another okay clearly related to one another where you've got the and organized so that you've got the sort of and a plant and animal world and then the human world and then the divine world at the top. You can also see that the divine world, that top register, is larger than the other registers, which makes sense, right? Because the gods would be relatively more important than human beings, for example. You also have these processions, that middle register with the people carrying gifts. Um, that's a procession that's happening on one kind of level ground line, meaning that this is a space that's unified. If you think back to, remember the narrative, um, or the sort of quasi-narrative that we saw at Chital Hoyuk, where it seemed like there was a hunting scene going on. The figures were sort of randomly scattered around in that hunting scene. Here you've got the sense of a sort of visual organization. So everybody's on a ground plane walking in procession towards the um, heavens. Here's an artist's reconstruction of what is depicted on the Warka vase, what survives of the Warka vase. So the, the dark outlines are areas that the artist is drawing that he's just directly copying from what's still visible on the Warka vase. And then the areas where you've got this kind of, you know, gray shaded um, um, 
picture is a artist's reconstruction of what's probably there. That section of the vase has broken off and been lost. So that's a sort of artist's guesstimate of what's there. So you can see here very clearly in the middle register the processions of meat and, and, and grains and vegetables that are being brought for sacrifice to the goddess in Nana. You can see there on the top register um, what should be recognizable as wine, vases that would be containing wine there on the top right that are much the same shape as the Warka vase itself. Baskets of fruits or vegetables basically of the plants that are at the bottom uh, of the register. You can see a sacrificial bull and that bull with the kind of telltale ancient Near Eastern long beard. There's Inanna a small figure bringing her a basket of fruit. So it seems to be telling us a story about a religious festival, a religious observation of some kind. This vase from 3200 BC, give or take a few years, is one of the first surviving examples we have of such a clear narrative. And so it's considered a really, really important piece of what you might call world heritage. You know, it's a real, it's a, it's a, surviving artifact from a important crucial point in the development of human culture and that's why it's been so treasured and why it was such a, a scandal when it was looted from the Iraq Museum. There's just some close-ups so that you can um, get a sense of what the actual relief looks like and again it's very shallowly carved out from the background I mean there is some um, you know some three-dimensionality to it but it's not the same thing as sculpture in the round it's not really like what we'll see later on with the Greeks um, especially high relief sculpture this is low relief so it's still fairly shallow and just sort of barely carved out of the background and then there's a view on the right of the Warka vase. This is actually the Warka vase from a few years a photo from a few years before it was looted. When it was returned back to the museum in 2005, it had been um, further damaged. And so, um, anyway, so there's a, a on the left another artist reconstruction drawing of what the images are in the vase, and then another picture of the vase on the right. And there you can see the Warka vase. Um, after it was returned, somebody, apparently, some dudes just drove up to the front of the museum in an old red Toyota, and they un they just unloaded this thing and then drove off from the museum and left it there. And uh, as far as we know, it's still inside the museum. Uh, in 2006, the guy who was the director of the museum actually fled and sought asylum in Syria because he was getting death threats all the time from within Iraq. So um, it's a, still a precarious situation for that museum. But again, I wanted to show you the Warka vase, and it's one of those things that you can th start thinking about, and uh, it could be a real interesting research topic for somebody looking at the kind of issues in cultural heritage and wartime and, uh, and, and things like that. So um, that's, my, that's my song and dance about the Warka vase, and um, we'll see you for the next lecture.